We now turn to a different subject, chemical versus physical change. Is there a difference between a chemical change and a physical change? As it turns out, yes there is. A physical change is a change in which a substance's physical appearance changes, but its chemical composition does not. Here are some examples. When water melts, it turns from a solid to a liquid. Is the liquid water still H2O? Is the solid water H2O? If the answer is yes, and it is, then melting water is not a chemical change. It's just a physical change. Another example is dissolving salt, sodium chloride, in water. When sodium chloride, whose chemical formula is NaCl, dissolves in water, is it still NaCl after the process is complete? Yes, it is. Because its chemical formula hasn't changed, the process is just a physical process, not a chemical one. This brings us to the next question. What is a chemical change? Well, a chemical change is a change in which a substance's chemical composition has been altered. One example is when we react a copper penny with nitric acid. The copper, whose chemical formula is Cu, interacts with the nitric acid to form a new compound called copper nitrate. Does copper nitrate have a different chemical formula from the original copper? You bet it does. So is this a chemical change instead of just a physical one? Absolutely. Another example is passing an electric current through water. When this happens, water, whose chemical formula is H2O, undergoes a change in which the hydrogen, the H part of the water, and the oxygen, the O part, separate and form two new separate and individual substances, H2 and O2. Do H2 and O2 separately have different formulas from the original H2O from which they came in this process? Yes, they do. Hence, this is a chemical change and not just a physical change. Remember then, to distinguish between a physical change and a chemical change, just ask yourself the question, during this change, does the chemical formula of anything change? If so, then it's a chemical change. If not, then it's a physical change. Physical changes are usually the kinds of things where something is converted from one physical state to another, such as liquid turning into a solid, or vice versa, liquid turning into a gas, or vice versa, or a solid turning into a gas, or vice versa. Other examples of physical changes including things such as if I were to take a big rock and pulverize it into dust, or take a newspaper and tear it into little pieces. I haven't changed the chemical formulas of any of the substances in those original items. I've only broken them down physically. Hence, those are physical changes rather than chemical changes. So does that make sense? Good. Then you're probably ready to do the following question. In the following list, only blank is not an example of a chemical reaction. We now turn to a different subject, which is once again another description of vocabulary. What is the difference between precision and accuracy? For a layperson, absolutely nothing. But for a scientist, these two terms are not the same thing. Strictly speaking, precision is how close a series of different measurements are to each other. The closer they are, the more precise they are. The precision of a measurement is not the same as its accuracy. Accuracy, in contrast, is how close a measurement is to reality. Let's take a look at some examples to see if we can clarify the difference between these two terms. Let's pretend that I'm trying to throw a bunch of darts at a dartboard and hit the target. Let's pretend that I do that and all three of my darts land over here right next to each other. If the target represents an actual measurement, have I gotten anywhere near my actual measurement? The answer is no. Have all of my individual measurements, which are way off from reality, been near each other? The answer is yes. So this is an example where the archer is very, very precise, but not accurate. Remember, once again, that precision is how close to each other all of your measurements are. Now in this second example, if I threw all of my darts, that is, if I took measurements and I saw that all of them 
were very, very close to each other and were very close to reality, we would say that my measurements have been both precise and accurate. In this latter example, we can see that I just threw darts all over the place, so I'm both imprecise and inaccurate. I hope you can see the difference between the two. I can have various measurements that are very, very precise, that is, they're very, very close to each other, but they might be very, very inaccurate if I'm using a poor scale that's about, I don't know, 90% off of what the actual weight of something is. In contrast, I can also have a... a in contrast, I can have a situation in which my scale does measure something a lot more close to being its accurate weight, but my different measurements may be very different from each other, so my measurement would be imprecise. I hope that's clear enough, the difference between precision and accuracy. Now I realize I'm throwing a boatload of different vocabulary terms at you, but honestly, as I mentioned before, that is what introductory science is often all about, learning a new language. Now with that said, I now want to introduce you to something called SI units. The SI stands for Système International, which is French for pass me the salt. Uh, though I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. In Spanish, SI can simply be said as C, which means Yes, for all of you who are amazing advanced Spanish speakers. So this SI, or C, system, which is often called the metric system by us North Americans, or Estadounidenses, has certain base units. This table, taken from our text, shows those base units for various means of measurement. For example, if I'm using SI units to measure mass, the base unit that I will use is a kilogram. If I'm using SI units for length, the base unit that I use is a meter, and so forth and so on. My favorite unit on this table is that of luminous intensity, which is called a candela. I have to be honest, I have never once in my entire life ever, ever, ever used a candela. Hopefully I'll have the opportunity sometime, but I don't foresee that coming anytime soon. The beauty of the SI system is that it operates in mathematically simple intervals of 10. Thus, if we attach any of the prefixes shown in this table to the beginning of one of our base units, we are effectively talking about a multiple of that base unit that is divisible by a factor of 10. For example, a decimeter shown right here in this table is one-tenth of a meter. A centimeter shown down here is one one-hundredth of a meter and so forth. In contrast, a kilometer, or kilometer, <laughs> is 1,000 meters, and so forth and so on. Although there are many more SI prefixes in existence than the ones that are shown here in this table, these are the most common ones that you will encounter in your everyday lives. For my class, I'm requiring you, my students, to memorize the prefixes shown in pink. Not just their names, but also to what exponents of 10 each of them correspond. With your command of SI units now, you should easily be able to figure out the answer to the next question. Of the following, blank is the smallest mass. Which brings us to our final subject, interconverting between different systems of temperature. As we North Americans know, ice water is really cold. In our North American temperature system, the Fahrenheit system, ice water stands at a temperature of around 32 degrees. But what if you're from a different country and you use the SI or metric system? Why, for you, the temperature of ice water is even colder. It's zero degrees. So is the temperature really different? <laughs> Absolutely not. The only difference is the system of measurement. And not to criticize my American roots, of which I am stalwartly proud, but our system of measurement for the f most part is really ridiculous. <laughs> As it turns out, there's a third system of measurement called the Kelvin system. And how does it compare to Celsius and Fahrenheit? Well, we can see by looking at this figure. We'll notice that in Celsius, water boils at 100 degrees. In Kelvin, water boils at 373.15. In Celsius, water freezes at 0 degrees. In Kelvin, water freezes at 273.15 Kelvins. Isn't that interesting? Now, Fahrenheit is, of course, all over the place. Fahrenheit boils at 
sorry, in Fahrenheit, water boils at 212, and it freezes at 32. I have no idea where they came up with those numbers or how they arranged the scale. Celsius and Kelvin, of course, were set at a scale corresponding to the boiling and freezing points of temperature at sea level, which are very, very convenient. We see then that Celsius and Kelvin have identical scales. The only difference is that they are separated by 273.15 degrees. Thus, if we were converting from Kelvin to Celsius, we would use this equation. Kelvin equals whatever the Celsius temperature is plus 273.15. Similarly, if we were going in the opposite direction, Celsius degrees equal whatever the Kelvin temperature is minus 273.15. And by the way, I do require you, my students, to memorize this equation. But what about interconverting between Celsius and Fahrenheit? Well, for that interconversion, we use these equations. Degrees Celsius equals 5 ninths times degrees Fahrenheit minus 32, of course, with these little brackets in place. And degrees Fahrenheit equals 9 fifths times Celsius plus 32, bracketed like this. Uh, yeah, I realize that's super confusing. So I promise you that if I give you any exams in which you have to interconvert between Celsius and Fahrenheit, I will give you these equations rather than requiring you to memorize them. But I do require you to memorize the interconversion between Celsius and Kelvin. To put your final knowledge to the test, we now finish with our last lecture problem. Which of the following is the highest temperature? I'll let you look at these examples and see if you can figure it out on your own. So that brings us to the end of today's lecture. Please tune in to our next lecture, which will continue our introductory discussion on general chemistry. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.